Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit effectv.com. Podcast. Welcome to Strategicon. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Unfortunately, co-host David only can't be with us due to his manic work and study schedule, but welcome to producer Michael Magali. Hello, how are you, John? Good, thanks. Today's topic will be on Australia's foreign policy direction with Jonathan Perlman. Jonathan is the editor of Australian Foreign Affairs and the world editor of the Saturday paper. He is a correspondent for the Straits Times newspaper in Singapore and was Australia Pacific correspondent for The Telegraph in the UK. Jonathan, welcome to Strategicom. Thanks, John. Great to be here. Jonathan, I suppose it is true to say that we in Australia are going through a period of pseudo alliance building at the moment with a quad and AUKUS. Apart from being a veritable alphabet soup of acronyms, are we any closer to discovering what the quad and AUKUS mean to Australian foreign policy? I think that's a very good question. And I think if we if we take both of them separately, maybe, I think that the quad is still really evolving um, and we're seeing a lot of debate in Australia and, and around the world really as to whether the Quad is going to make any uh, significant difference to power relations in Asia. The obvious problem with it is is India. Australia, Japan and the US see things fairly similarly and, uh, you know, see China fairly similarly, but India um, has a much more independent position when it comes to great power relations and its its approach to, you know, generally to alliances um, is quite different to, to the other three. So I think the Quad is, is still evolving. It's still not clear whether other countries might join. Could New Zealand join? Could Vietnam join? AUKUS, on the other hand, is also is also quite interesting because... I think the heart of AUKUS really was the nuclear-powered submarines announcement. I mean, AUKUS does have other components that are important, um, intelligence agreements and um, and other sort of technical forms of cooperation, but the heart of it was the nuclear-powered submarines and it's still very unclear uh, exactly what Australia is going to end up with. Indonesia and Malaysia have expressed concerns about the subs, uh, Australia is still fishing around. Richard Miles, the Defence Secretary, is in Europe this week, sort of looking at different options. Australia's got a very checkered history when it comes to procuring submarines, and it's still unclear exactly what's going to emerge at the end of this sort of eighteen-month consultation process that Australia is undertaking at the moment. So I think I think both AUKUS and the Quad are are emerging and evolving at the moment. Yeah, look, um, with regard to the investment in the Quad, for instance, between the US, Japan and India, obviously, uh, within this quadrilateral dialogue, you do have this trilateral spin-off, which you've just mentioned, where the US, Japan and Australia basically sing from the same song sheet. But of course, our Indian friends, they believe in their own strategic autonomy. They would like to think that India is a great power now. It's not going to be something in the future, but they are a gigantic geopolitical unit in the middle of the Indo-Pacific. And so therefore, they think that they don't want to be submitting themselves to Western dictates on how the Indo-Pacific is managed. 
This is a complication for the quad, right? Definitely, definitely. I mean, in some senses, you could see it as a diplomatic success that India um, is part of the quad and is willing to be part of the, the quad's you know, really emergence in the past couple of years. I mean, it was this sort of defunct grouping for a long time and now they have leaders meetings, which is significant. So in a sense, you could see India as um, being quite bold, really, in terms of its willingness to join. But its worldview is very, very different. You know, for one thing, it sees itself as a rising power in Asia, which it is, and, uh, you know, is, is sort of trying to carve out its own sphere of influence in South Asia. But it also just has its background and history of independence, which, you know, you, you talked about, which means that it's it's open to groupings, but it's less open to alignments and mm. allies, which Australia, Japan and the US are obviously much more comfortable with, you know, forming close, deep security alliances. And India does not have that history and it remains wary of it. And we see that, I think, with the war in Ukraine, where, you know, India has not joined the kind of Western sanctions and the Western resistance to Russia. Because India has got this very close military relationship with Russia, half its kind of military kit comes from Russia. And it's not prepared to just kind of drop that and make a kind of values-based decision and back the international s sanctions that the US is leading. So there are different differences between India and, and the other three, as you say, and I think they are going to prevent AUKUS's emergence into anything like a kind of close NATO-style alliance. But supporters of the Quad will say that, um, you know, that it, it's a coalition, it can do important work, it can hold military exercises, it can support aid, it can, you know, it can support a kind of diplomatic ballast in the region. And so the Quad is, uh, is kind of growing in significance, but its potential is limited by India's kind of values and outlook, I think. Actually, we'll return to the, uh, the old man in the room, India, a little bit later. But for now, I'll go back to AUKUS and I'll ask the same question. How invested do you think the US and the UK are in AUKUS? It seems that Australia is doing all the heavy lifting on AUKUS because we want nuclear powered boats. But the Biden administration and whoever will be running number 10, either Liz Trust or, or Trust um, or Rishi Sunak, they may have different priorities following on from Russia's invasion in Ukraine, yeah? Definitely. I think that's that's a really great question. I think I think the US is definitely invested in boosting its alliance with Australia because if it is going to continue, you know, to see China as a strategic rival, then Australia is going to become increasingly significant to it because we we're going to be somewhere where 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 the US can place troops and ships um so we're important geographically to that strategic mission that the US currently has. Now, the US may not stick with that. The US might over time decide that it doesn't want to kind of up the stakes against China. The UK, well, you know, it is interesting to see what will happen with a new prime minister. Boris Johnson obviously was a strong supporter of mm. the UK becoming an important Pacific power again. And under Johnson, as even as foreign minister, they started to look to open new diplomatic presences across the Pacific. But, you know, Johnson's on the way out and uh, and that can change. So I think you're right. I think it's really hard to predict. And I think it's a really interesting question to raise the extent to which AUKUS is dependent on the leaders and the administrations in London and, and Washington. We're seeing con continuity in Canberra with the Albanese government. But it's really hard to know exactly how how continuous it will be as administrations change in, 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 in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, it seems to me that, you know, you can have leaders summits, you can have leaders talking about policy. But in the end, you know, it's it's about the government signing off on properly structured policy, which makes more sense for countries like Australia, because we are the smallest of all the countries that we've mentioned, both in the Quad and also in AUKUS as well. So if we want to guarantee our role in these kind of structures, these structures have to have 
more than they currently do have. At the moment, they are very loose arrangements that, as you rightly point out, they, they may grow, they may stop still, they may atrophy over time or be dropped altogether, depending on how the more powerful leaders in these respective groups behave or choose to behave, right? But yeah. if we turn to the Albanese government's foreign policy, how do you think it's progressing? I mean, he's he's done a lot of traveling in his first few, few weeks in office, including to the Ukrainian war zone. Has this traveling done anything to benefit Australia in practical terms? Uh, I think in the Pacific it has. I think that it was surprising, you know, that Maurice Payne didn't travel to the Pacific after the Solomon Islands kind of security deal with China was announced. And Anthony Albanese and and Penny Wong uh, were both, well, Albanese went for the Pacific Islands Forum to Fiji, but um, but both have been to the Pacific. P- Penny Wong got signed in quickly as foreign minister so that she could attend the quad meeting, but then she was hardly back in Australia a few hours and she turned straight around and started going, going off to the Pacific Islands. So I think that outreach has helped to build relations and to kind of send a new message. But, of course, Australia's new kind of more ambitious Climate policy has been crucial to that because it's allowed it's allowed the government and the Albanese government to kind of send a message that it's a real reset, that it's not just about flying visits, that actually there's some policy behind it. So I think that's been quite successful. I mean, definitely it hasn't it hasn't persuaded Solomon Islands to kind of switch tack. It's still pursuing close relations with China, but I think it's helped to kind of build new relations in in the Pacific. Elsewhere, though, I th- you know, I think it's a work in progress. I think it's been really good to see Australia start to focus again on Southeast Asia. I think that's really important. And Penny Wong's made visits to Indonesia and Malaysia pretty early on. Um, it would be great to see Albanese as well start to visit more countries in Southeast Asia. Australian prime ministers just seem to have stopped visiting places like Thailand and the Philippines. It's bizarre. So, you know, it would be good to see that increase. But I think beyond the Pacific and and Southeast Asia, I think it's been really a message of continuity from Canberra. I don't think we've seen any significant changes in in foreign policy or any significant change in focus so far under the Albanese government. You know, Jonathan, it's interesting. Traditionally, our relations with the South Pacific have been viewed by South Pacific Islanders in very negative ways. You know, we're the white neo-colonial entity throwing its weight around and telling the brown people of Southeast Asia what to do, which of course offends them, and rightly so. But it puts Australia in an unenviable position because ultimately we would like to get South Pacific Islanders to become more coherently aligned with Australian foreign policy. We would like to act on behalf of the United States in certain ways and means in the region so the US can divest its interests in other places, like, for instance, Europe and Northeast Asia, where Australia's impacts will always be much smaller. Where do you think Australia is going to get the foreign policy now necessary to break this kind of deadlock and, and allow us not just to talk at them about climate change, but to actually make them stakeholders in Australia's view of the region. Is that even possible? I think it's been a real problem for Australian foreign policy for for a long time, our ability, you know, to step outside our own world view and try to see the world in new ways and in ways that other countries see it. I think we haven't had to do that because... We've been so fortunate because we've had an ally first in the UK and then in the US, which just happens to share our worldview and share our language and share our cultural outlook, but also happens to be the most powerful country in Asia and the most powerful country in the world. So we've just had this beautiful run where we haven't really had to think too much about how precarious things can get and about how different countries might have different approaches. And You know, if you look compare that with Southeast Asia, which has been caught in great power rivalry for so long, and the countries in Southeast Asia are very aware how things can change, how things can shift, how they need to understand how China sees the world and how the US sees the world. Mm. I don't think Australia's really, really had to do that. So I think that we definitely need 
to um, to start doing that, and the Pacific is is a really good example. I mean, the Pacific states do see China completely differently to yeah. to the way Australia does, and unless we understand that, and same for Southeast Asia. I mean, countries in Southeast mm-hmm. Asia also tend to be much more comfortable with China's rise. They might not like it, but they're not as fearful of it as Australia tends to be. So we're going to need to kind of, you know, understand the way other countries uh, view this region and view the world. But we don't have any choice because the world's changing and because we can't just sit comfortably as a sort of US allied corner of, you know, Western outpost. Uh, Doctora Ramos, a la sala de espera. Hay un problema que afecta a muchos niños que no puedo resolver sola. Se llama estrés tóxico. Es la manera en que el cuerpo de los niños responde a experiencias difíciles, desde palabras bruscas hasta una pérdida dolorosa. Esto hace que sea más difícil combatir infecciones y enfermedades. También aumenta el riesgo de problemas de salud a largo plazo. Pero hay pasos que los padres pueden tomar para ayudar. Aprende cuatro cosas que puedes hacer para superar el estrés tóxico en firstfivecalifornia.com. Anymore, that's those days are, are ending. Jonathan, Australia's relationship with China has been grabbing national headlines. This was especially so under the former Morrison government. What do you think of uh, Foreign Minister Penny Wong's handling of Australia-China relations? Is it better than that of the Morrison government or just superficially different? And the reason why I raise this is that, as we all know, there is continuity and discontinuity between parties and governments as they cycle through. So what do you think are the main points worth taking away with regard to our current government's behaviour toward China? I think it is largely superficial at the moment. I think that it's a matter of tone and rhetoric. I think that that's important um, because I think that some real diplomatic mistakes were made by the last government, which really undermined relations with China and diplomacy is important. And how you speak and the ways you convey messages are really important. And I think that the last government made some mistakes when it came to how AUKUS was announced, failure to consult other countries in the region about that, Uh, when it came to announcing the COVID inquiry was poorly handled. So I think those things did not help relations with China. But I think that the Albanese government and Penny Wong are largely continuing a lot of those policies. The way they talk about China is not all that different to the way the Morrison government did. Albanese, you know, said very early on, it's China that's changed. That's the difference. So I don't think that the policies have really changed. But one of the advantages I think democracies have is that you get a change of government and you get to kind of come in as a new government and cut a lot of cords, get some fresh air. And I think Mm. they've tried to do that. I think this government has tried to kind of capitalise on that, say we're a new government, we're open to talking, you know, we are changing our rhetoric, we're going to be less combative, we're not going to repeat Peter Dutton's lines about, you know, kind of war in Taiwan. But that is, you know, in in your words, sort of superficial. I mean, it's a matter of rhetoric so far and not policy. So, Jonathan, do you think that we are in the midst of what Graham Allison once said between the US and China, Thucydides trap, you know, a competition between the old established power and the new rising power? Or do you think this was a, always an oversimplification of that of the Sino-American relationship? I think it's a, a fair representation. I don't have the historical uh, kind of knowledge that someone like uh, Graham Allison has, and um, but I think we are definitely seeing this dynamic here where you have, and we just see it, you see this almost on a daily basis, I think, in, in terms of the relationship between the US and China, where you have this rising, increasingly ambitious power coming up against a power that is entrenched and that uh, is not willing to cede cede ground and that both of them have, you know, just see themselves and their future roles in the world completely differently. And we just see that, I think, playing out um, on a daily basis. And I can see why Graham Allison wrote his book because it's dangerous dynamic, I think. So I do think that is what's playing out. And we see that playing out in the South Pacific, in Southeast Asia, that that rivalry and that dynamic between the US and China is like the basis for it is, you know, a competition for for global power. So I think this is 
Thucydides trap is kind of unfolding as predicted. Mm. Australia's relationship with Russia has never been great, but Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has really set things back. Has the oft-mentioned close relationship between Russia and China exaggerated the threat both countries pose to the Indo-Pacific region? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the Russia-China relationship is really interesting and not, not as clear-cut, maybe, as it's, mm. as it's often presented in, in Australia. Russia and China are are rivals in a lot of ways, you know, particularly for power and influence in Eurasia. And it's been convenient for them to form this relationship for now. But Jeff Raby, the former Australian ambassador to China, has a piece about this in our next issue of Australian Foreign Affairs, and he compares that kind of no-limits partnership um, between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. I mean, he compares that to the sort of the Ribbentrop pact between the the Nazis and Russians on the eve of World War II in the sense that this was, you know, really a marriage of convenience between rivals. And I, you know, I think that's really interesting. And I don't think that's how it's largely been seen in Australia. It's been seen as these two authoritarian leaders, you know, effectively kind of enemies of Australia forming together to form an even, you know, greater and more powerful uh, alliance that can threaten the West. And I think it's more complicated than that because I think that Russia and China um, have kind of historical and geographic tensions. And while it's been convenient for them to form this relationship now, you know, I don't think it's going to be some sort of lasting relationship that results in the two of them, you know, sort of forming some block that's going to threaten Australia and Asia. Yeah. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. And we're speaking with the editor of Australian Foreign Affairs, Jonathan Perlman, on Australian Foreign Affairs. American analyst Peter Zine wrote a particularly pessimistic tome entitled The End of the World is Just the Beginning. My colleague David and I addressed this book and its main themes in our last episode. In his book, Zine raises a very good argument to suggest that the current international order is over, that global supply chains are breaking down, that global populations are generally heading towards negative territory, and that the world of the future will be smaller, poorer, and perhaps less developed than the one that we still live in. Do you agree with this assessment? It's very grim, isn't it? It Uh, is. (laughs) I hope that I hope that that assessment is wrong. It's hard to know. I mean, people always describe the current time as sort of, you know, an era of uncertainty and say that things have never been uncertain. But that's sort of an easy thing to say, isn't it? Because <laughs> there's never really any certainty, real certainty about the future. And I do think, you know, in terms of what we were discussing earlier, I think that for Australia, that uncertainty is, is real. You know, we're not. We face much worse times and more dangerous times in Australia than we do now. Um, and World War II was obviously, you know, incomparable in terms of the threat that we faced. But I think, you know, I think the world is changing for Australia in ways that just make our foreign policy and our diplomacy more complicated at the least. But, you know, whether those dynamics that we've been talking about, the Chinese-US rivalry, issues like Taiwan, um, are going to sort of explode and lead to, you know, lead to a real, really bleak future. I think that's hard to know. And obviously, like I think underlying that comment that you read is the other threat of climate change, which which is also potentially really bleak. I mean, look at the crazy phenomena that are unfolding at the moment. Um, floods in Pakistan. The rainfall there has just been absurd in the last two months. And then the, you know, heat heat waves and drought across um, China and across Europe is kind of terrifying. Uh, So to some extent, that might be more likely to cause that bleak future uh, that you've outlined. I mean, it seems now more likely to come from climate change than than geopolitics. Jonathan, do you think getting too close to India's Hindu nationalist Modi government will place Canberra in a difficult position 
regarding its defense of human rights generally. I mean, what seems to be forgotten in all the brouhaha regarding the strategic threat posed by China is that while there are ongoing and systematic human rights abuses, some say even genocide in Western China against the Uyghur people, Hindu nationalists aren't particularly kind to India's 204 million strong Muslim population, nor its 200 million strong Dalit underclass. If sectarian and caste oppression continues to be part of the ruling BJP's domestic behavior, then doesn't defending the BJP and Modi become a problematic issue for Canberra, or will it simply ignore this uncomfortable issue? It's going to cause discomfort, but I'm going to give a a kind of um, maybe depressing sort of answer, which is that I think that will be ignored if uh, Mm. Australia decides it has to ignore it. I just think that that is the way that that nation states tend to behave and Australia will be no different, you know, if it has to. And it has already to some extent. It hasn't really been particularly critical of of Modi's human rights record already, you know, and that's because it's not in its interest to do so. So I think, you know, unfortunately the kind of track record and not I'm not referring specifically to Australia's track record but just the way that states tend to behave is they don't tend to prioritise values uh, when it comes to kind of cold, hard interests. I don't think that that means that the human rights concerns shouldn't play a part and that they won't play a part, they will play a part. I mean, I think they will complicate the relationship with India, particularly if, you know, if we see this continued um, expression of Hindu nationalism in India, I think that it will complicate relations. We have you know, a huge Indian diaspora community in Australia that will probably, um, you know, elements of that will, will, you know, may become vocal. So I think it plays a part in the overall relationship. And yes, it can complicate the relationship. But when it just comes down to kind of Australia pressing its interests in the region, if it decides it needs to kind of cosy up to, to Delhi for its own interests, say in trying to kind of counter China or something, mm. some other important interest. I just think the depressing fact really in history is that countries and governments and states will will ignore the values questions and the human rights questions and just their interests. So it's maybe maybe a depressing answer, but I think that's just the reality. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Jonathan, many thanks for your time tonight on Strategicon. Thanks so much, John. Thanks so much for having me. No worries at all. My thanks to our guest, editor of Australian Foreign Affairs, Jonathan Perlman, to producer Michael Magali, and to the Oscast Network. To our audience, thanks for listening. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to the audio version of Strategicon through the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. You can also watch our podcasts on video through the Strategicon Raw YouTube channel when they're available, easily accessed by clicking on the link provided on our website. Until next time, it's goodbye from me, John Bruni. You've been listening to Strategicon, a Sage International podcast. Oscast. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.